I met my next guest over 10 years ago when I took an animation voice acting class taught by him in his studio in Studio City, California. I was stunned that he remembered me when I reached out for an interview. I'm Lexi, and this is Delightfully Different. He might be familiar to you. Very familiar, but you've probably never seen his face. He's known as Krang, Wildcat, Casey Jones, Falcon, Slick the Turtle, Coach Frogface, The President and I Am Legend, and thousands more. No matter in which era you grew up, if you watched cartoons, you've heard him. Hello, this is Krang from the Technodrome. My name is Pat Fraley. And I'm a voiceover. (laughs) (laughs) So, Pat, how many characters would you say that could estimate? Because I know it's a lot. How many characters would you estimate that you voiced throughout your whole career? Um, You know, I always think I have one voice, but I do a lot of stuff with it. (laughs) So it's hard to answer that question. I guess, you know thousands yeah but i've gone to denny's and had pancakes thousands all mediocre okay Okay. so you know (laughs) how many i've done i don't know i really don't know lexi Uh, hundreds and hundreds maybe a thousand it seems like it would you say that krang was your most famous character out of everybody that you voiced for younger people, and I'm talking younger in the 30s. Okay. But I did, you know, Scooby Doo, Huckleberry Hound, the Flintstones. I, I did so many different eras because I, I caught the tail end of that in the late 70s with original casts. So I guess for younger, yeah, the Disney Tailspin, a filmation Brave Star, um, the re- original of Ghostbusters, I, you know, it depends on when you grew up. You know, when I go in and they go, oh, you do voices, huh? What'd you do? I look at it, how old they are. And okay. then I can, yeah, because I can say Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and I go, yeah, what else? Anyway. <laughs> well, that was but, definitely, um, I'm a little too old for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but I do have friends that were in that age group that, I mean, you have diehard fans for Teenage Mutant. And kids went crazy for that. So I'm sure yeah, they go crazy for you. Yeah, apparently you don't have to be dead to be a legacy. <laughs> when I meet, you know, it's funny, Lexi, because I was telling my wife, Renee, about this. Um, a voiceover is kind of like a puppeteer because when we see a puppet, we like a beanie, we, we kind of own them. You know, the, we're happy when they come up to me or when they find out I did the, you know, the uh, the bird they strapped in the photograph in the Flintstones. OK. I'm going to talk to my union about this. <laughs> Depending on how old they are, they are so happy. They hug me. Now, you, they wouldn't do that with Brad Pitt. No. Or Harrison Ford or anybody or Mark or anybody. But they own me. They kind of semi-own me because they let me in their living room. And uh, you you did that bird, and I knew exactly what it was because I'm from that era of cartoons, and that is definitely what I remember. And I still watch the Flintstones on Saturday mornings when I wake up. It's on regular TV these days, and it may, all of a sudden my heart went, oh, oh, it's um, the bird. <laughs> when I did it, I, I was that way. I mean, I remember I did the Jetsons, and I was Judy Jetson's boyfriend. Jet Screamer. No, no. Okay. Skyhawk Mike, the drummer. Okay. <laughs> that streamer probably died. But Skyhawk, Skyhawk Mike, dude, you know. And um, I was excited, too. What, what was the very first um, character that you ever got? Like, wh- when you first started voice acting, were you acting, acting like on camera at first, and then you moved to voice acting, or did you go straight into VO? No, no. I went into theater. I did 50 plays before I did any characters, even in the commercial. I was in Australia before I really did any character working. And I remember getting paid. But uh, that was my uh, entrance into voiceover. And it's odd because I was very good at amateur theater because I was exaggerated. My mom was exaggerated and funny. And so 
I was a nav, and that when I'm of an, of an age, I'm 74. I was an age. If you wanted to be a performer, you went to theater. There okay. were no improv schools. You couldn't do stand up. There was no comedy. Nothing. <clears throat> so I got into it because they wanted somebody. Did, did anybody do a James Cagney? Well, I did. And I was a rat dog and something on a commercial. And I got a reputation in Australia because I went over there to do more theater, more Shakespeare. Really? And uh, yeah. And then I realized, well, I'm better at this than I am Chekhov. Because Chekhov, you know, the pilot light would go out. I was okay with Shakespeare and bigger stuff. French farce, I was perfect. But, you know, I wanted to be a performer. God gave me this passion for teaching and performing. And so I thought, well, there you are. And within two years, I'm like, what do they need exaggerated people? Cartoons. Within two years or so, I was in Han- Los Angeles at Hanna-Barbera doing a cartoon. That's incredible. Do you remember the name of the first character, the very first one that you voiced for Hanna-Barbera? Yes. Yeah, it was Scooby-Doo Goes Hollywood. Okay. And, yeah, and Variety Magazine reviewed it as Scooby-Doo Doo-Doo. It was that bad. And I was a James Cagney rat dog. And a mall guard. I made a living being a mall guard. You want to no. hear it? Yes, I do. Hey, you kids can't be in here. What the oh? They always get knocked out. What the oh? You got to be able to do that. I like that you have the lines memorized from that long ago, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was about it. You know, they were always another thing. I'm, I've been all my life. Even through my MFA at Cornell in acting, I have been dyslexic. Really? I can't read. And once I read, I don't know what it means. You know, it's horrible. Yeah. But uh, but cartoons, curiously enough, are short lines. Yeah. So it was okay. Do you ever get to ad lib some of the lines in the cartoons or are they written out no matter what? Oh, you can add, look, depending on the shows. I did a show with Howie Mandel producing called Bobby's World. Oh, I remember that. Yeah, and Rob Paulson and I were cast as the same character, Um, like Mogard, right? Yeah, okay. (laughs) Right. And he was a high guy. And and, uh, I'd go, you know, everyone loves a hero in your mind. And he'd say, hug me, you know. (laughs) And... Jenny McSwing was directing, and the uh, writers were from Second City, I think. Uh, Jim Stoll and Jim Fisher. Okay. And uh, they came in one day, and Jenny said, where are the lines for uh, Meeker and Smurd? That was Rob and I. And we go, we don't write them anymore. Oh. Said, really? Yeah, we just leave 12 minutes to ad lib, because they won't, they won't ch- they'll change it anyway. So you- we had this whole show where we'd ad lib. That was that, is that more fun to be able to ad lib like that? Well, it was when we did that in Ninja Turtles because we got away with murder. Oh, okay. We were being <laughs> naughty and being paid for it. <laughs> we weren't better. We were just naughty. Do you get like a writing credit when you ad lib that much of it? Heck no. <laughs> the writing credit? Come on. There's a joke about that that I can't retell. Okay. But but it was Ed Asner, my buddy's favorite line. And um, I'll lead it up to um, you got to be out of your effing mind. Okay, gotcha. that, That's the, uh, okay, <laughs> a guy, a writer has, uh, he can't write. He, he's he got, what do you call it? Uh, writer's writer's block. block. Okay. So he goes to bed. That night, a gremlin, a gremlin comes in and types up a whole script. He wakes up in the morning, looks at it, can't believe it. Puts a piece of paper on the roller. The next night, the gremlin comes in and writes the whole thing. And this goes on. The guy's a big success. And he goes, you know, I'm going to wake up and uh, see this guy. So he wakes up and the gremlin goes, ah. And he goes, no, no, don't be afraid. Listen, you've made me a mint. I'm so, uh, great. Anything I can do for you, money, a car, a house. And he goes, well, could I maybe have my... My name under yours, one is this written by? And the guy laughs and goes, <laughs> you got to be on your effing mind. <laughs> that was one of Asner's favorites. Well, it certainly didn't hurt your career. <laughs> you no, it didn't. Well. <laughs> um, 
So you were Krang for uh, it, what was the year that you were mainly uh, Krang in the it was oh, a couple hundred years, nine years. <laughs> OK, nine years. And then in 2016, um, Brad Garrett was Krang in one of yes. the movies. And I know you one guys my, are pals. One of my best friends. Yes. <laughs> and do you know what? what, what Lex, we ne- Lex, we never talked about it. Really? Well, you don't. You know, with your friends, you go, how's your wife? What are you doing? What are you driving? Uh, no, I'm paying for this. You don't ever talk about work. Really? With Rob, I was close to an Ed Asner. He'd go, where'd you get your teeth? <laughs> I'm a dentist. You're about a, th- a grand up a piece. And he looked at me and went, I don't smile anyway. <laughs> <laughs> we don't talk about work. I go, well, what was William Shatner like? Oh, he's lousy. But he got better. You know, that was the extent of it. So did he, do you think he did better than you? Who did it better, you or Brad? I don't know if I heard him. You know, I'm looking forward to enslaving you. A cage full of tortoises might be nice. Because oh, Michael really? Bay hated my crank. He had anybody to it but me. Really? Because I was, I, well, I was funny. Well, it's about time. At last, a shrine erected on the awesome might that is Lord Krang. He didn't want a funny villain, he wanted an evil one. I he don't know if like I heard Brad. him. <laughs> yeah, Brad. Well, there was Roseanne Barr. There was many people. Was it Roseanne Barr? Yeah, I think so. Krang has waited a long time. Like I'm crying. I am uh, that did him. Uh, I heard Townsend Coleman's, which was really good because it was close to me. Yeah. But uh, and uh, but no, I, I don't know if I heard it. <laughs> Never said that sucked or that was great. Never. I'm just trying to start a rivalry between the two of you. Yeah, well, we have a rivalry in other ways. I'm sure you do. I tease um, him, he teased me. You know, the first time I met him, we had the same manager. And I came into Muzo and Frank, a famous restaurant. And there was my mentor, Ron Feinberg, and Brad Garrett was seated. This is before uh, Everyone Loves Raymond. Yeah. And I was wearing those kind of Miami Vice pants, big with suspenders, you know. Okay. And uh, Ron went, kid, sit down, sit down. And R- Brad Garrett looked up at me and goes, hey, Pat, do you get to take the pants off when the bet's gone? <laughs> <laughs> that was the beginning. You guys do some, uh, you teach classes together too sometimes because I've seen the invitation pop up. Well, yes, I try to get Brad in once in a while because he's so wonderful. He and he won't take money. He won't take my checks. And so really? <laughs> I support his charity, which is Maximum Hope. And uh, I do what I can do, but he's reluctant to take money from another actor. Well, I mean, he's doing all right, too. So, <laughs> yeah, really, he's fine. It's good. When you are on a show like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and you've got that character that's iconic, you're also a bunch of other voices on these cartoons as well. Yeah. Maybe smaller characters. When you are recording, do you sometimes have to talk to yourself in the recording and do two different voices at the same time? Never. Oh, yeah, you do. and But you don't take very much of a pause. Right. You go, um, hey, how you doing? I'm okay. How are you? I'm good. Well, I was going to tell you, why am I? Why? Well, I was going to ask you, what'd you get that funny loud voice? Well, I, I made it up. You know, it's like a, you know, the thing you have to have is a skill of not being terribly bright. And I've got that. I've got that in spades. <laughs> I didn't know that was the trick, because for yeah. me, going back and forth from one to another, having a conversation is very difficult. And you just did it like it was nothing right in front of me. Well, it was that Gilda Radner show. She was a Girl Scout and she'd go to her room and she had the Judy show. Okay. She, that's me. <laughs> um, Talking to yourself in the mirror. <laughs> by the way, yesterday I think. When do when do we have Renee? When did we get the in and out? Yesterday or the day before? Yesterday, I swear. I pulled into In and Out 
there was a person talking to themselves across the street, which you see in L.A. I don't know why. You know, they talk, they scream and yell and ran and curse, and, right? Yeah. There was another person that was talking to themselves up the block. They <laughs> walked closer to each other. I was watching them. They didn't communicate. <laughs> I tell, I said to the guy that was taking my order, I go, did you see that? And he goes, yeah. I never seen that before in my life. That is fun. Yeah, that's kind of a miracle. Yeah. Um, when you first started doing voice acting and we're doing cartoons, what did your family think of it? Like before you got married and stuff, what did your family think? Well, of it? my mom was a big fan no matter what, even okay. when I was in college, because I started acting when I was four. Oh, okay. There was something on Facebook said, name an expression that your mom or dad gave you all the time. Yeah. And I put my mom and she said, pick up your Oscar. You know, she would tease me, and but she loved me doing what I loved. My dad was reluctant, but not discouraging. That's Although good. I heard that when I was uh, in gra college, Whitman, um, he flew or met with Jack Fryman, who ran the theater that time, was in Seattle. I was in Walla Walla where I went to school. And he said to Jack, he said, uh, is he any good? Can, can he make any money? Is he any good? And Jack said, well, he's the first in the theater in the morning and the last to leave at night. And later I said, Jack, that was so nice of you to say that because he started sending me uh, cutouts of James Stewart and stuff. You know, he was behind me. Yeah. It was so nice of you to do that. But, you know, he never said I was any good or not. <laughs> because I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So you have um, adult children. Yes. Do, you, do any of them do voice acting? Well, uh, Harrison, my second born, well, they've all done it. <laughs> they were kind of forced on, to do it. <laughs> yeah, well, for, really, to do the cover on an audio book or yeah. somebody would say, get your kid in here. And Ford was... Uh, he literally did a part before he could talk, practically. Really? And he's really funnier than I am. But nobody made a living out of it. Henry's better than I am. He's they, really good. Did yeah, they love I, the, the fact that you were voicing all these cartoons? And I'm sure they didn't know. They didn't? They, in fact, when they found out my neighbor, Ed Asner, was an actor, <laughs> they'd gone to Blockbusters. They, they saw him on the cover of something. And they came in and go, Uncle Ed's an actor. They were mad. And they didn't know Brad right Garrett would come over. They thought, well, there's a tall guy, Rob Paulson, he can sing a cappello. They, they thought that everyone was like that. But where they found out that I did voices for a living was when I did Ninja Turtles. They were and about what? 10, 11, something like that. Did they think it was well, cool? No. <gasps> They didn't. They never, no, no, they would tell people, well, he sells insurance. They thought I did funny voices out in the bunkhouse. Later <laughs> on, one time, one boy who was going to military school in Virginia had me come in the room with about five or six other cadets and he said, Dad, do a Sean Connery, do a did Peter Lorre. He actually uh, showed off with me. I really? was so nervous. Like, <laughs> I couldn't believe it. You talked about the pressure and he never said anything. And that was it. That is so cute. Did you have grandchildren too? No. Just granddaughter. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're about 30, mid thirties now, not married. None of them married. No okay. Married. Okay. So when I took your class and you learned, I learned this in other classes as well, that you kind of have to have a bag of ready to go characters and to develop those characters on your own without seeing anything. Right. How, how many do you have in your bag ready to go? About a dozen. And you, you kind of recycle those different 12 ones into slightly different things? Yeah, it's like uh, Michael Bell says, we do work like uh, Mr. Potato Head. We change the nose, change the ears. That's it. That's it's, it. It's really good management versus uh, creative ability. Because now they're evocative, unique, and developed. And you come in and, you know, Jim McSwain, I would go, um, what do you got for this, Friday? And then, well, I was thinking about, no, 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 what, what else? Well, I was thinking about, no, no, no. Then I always save one, the third, and go, no, I don't want to do this one for you because it sucks. It's really bad. No, do it. 
that would the would be the one she'd pick. But there were but they were psychologically developed and flourished. And when I first started working at Hanna Barbera with Dawes Butler, Mel Blanc, Don Messick, all these wonderful actors, and Michael Bell, they they come in with different things every day. And I thought I'm in the wrong league. I should be pl- playing triple A ball. This is the majors. But then I was there for a couple of weeks and I realized, wait, that's the same character with a different dialect. They were doing the same thing. That's why I was so successful at teaching, because I taught how they learned and how they worked. The pros. I'm Lexi, and this is Delightfully Different. Today, I'm talking with voice actor Pat Fraley. What was the audition process like when you first started? And are you still auditioning for things? Do you still go out for stuff? Yeah, yo, yo, still audition. So it's a little different because uh, I, when I started, I'd go in and I'd audition like you'd know you would. Yeah. And you wouldn't get it nine times out of ten or more. <laughs> and um, then... I got to take you back to Steve Martin, the comedian. Okay. Because Steve Martin said they always ask me advice about how to get successful. And they expect me to talk about agents and managers and stuff, but I didn't. I always gave them the same advice and they never took it. And it was, you got to get really good. Okay. <laughs> and, and then Steve said, what happens is they start coming for you and it's easier. Oh. And that's, that's what happened to me. I, I, I came to town at 30 and I was really good. Yeah. I was funny. I was fast. I could do characters. And I got a reputation for working when I wasn't working because I came down with some, with some money. So I didn't have to wait tables. And so the other actors, oh, get Fraley. You know, he's good. Well, they, they didn't know. They thought I was working. And then they come and say, I want Pat Fraley. Or they would uh, produce something and then they go, okay, bring in Pat Fraley too. They knew me and they wanted me. So today when something's up for grabs, they're coming to you. You're not necessarily going to an open casting call or anything like that. No, I'm too old. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm 74. I mean, when we had a 50-year-old come in and do a part, we go, what the hell did they got that old guy for? I don't know. <laughs> and, and when I was in my... Uh, 60s some there was a 50 year old character and uh they called my agent and said look we got a, a role and we want Freddy to do it can he do can he pay, play age they didn't tell the person i was 60 can you do 50 they thought i was young <laughs> can i do age oh yeah i think i can do 50 yeah <laughs> the answer is always yes i can do that right <laughs> yes and so i teach more now than yeah. i perform Oh, yeah, I perform every so often. But COVID wiped us out because animation is a ensemble cast recording session. Yeah. You have almost the whole cast there. The last cartoon show I did, I was the only guy. Really? I was the only person. What was that? What was the last one? I can't. Carson M., I think it was called. It was a. Uh, it was down the street. I don't know. They put it on... Uh, I have no idea. I can't pronounce <laughs> the name. Okay. Carson, okay. I think. Okay. And I play okay. A bartender. Yeah. And I've I've done some video games, but you know, they're is always there, a sing along. Is there a big difference between doing video game voice acting and and cartoons animation? Well, in yes. Um cartoons are a little more in the styles are all over the place, but they can go wild and woolly. In video games, especially in the last five years, they're really like movie acting. Oh. They're bone real. So okay. you can't get caught acting. Huh. So the number one thing is is reality. Number two is choices. Where it's flipped in the cartoons. It's choices in reality, yeah, uh, whatever. Interesting, huh? I never looked at Daffy Duck and thought, well, he's not motivated. <laughs> but it's but he's silly. <laughs> he's definitely silly. Yeah. Um, how often would you say you hold cl- like in-person classes? Do you still do like what I did when I came to uh, no. Studio City? No more. No, I can't I bring lucky. people into private studios. So why? Because the private studios closed because the producers got used to having people from home not charging them anything. Right. Also, but I teach home study courses. Yes. Because they can take one, do the homework, send me a recording. I personally guide them and listen to it. And that's what I do. 
And it's and more it like well. one on one at that point. Right. And rather than a group. Yes, it's better. Um, and so uh, I know that you had Brad Garrett helping you sometimes on some of these. Who are some of the other uh, voice acting coaches that join you to teach some of these classes or uh, online studies like you have? Oh, Rob Paulson. Um, let, let me think. Uh, the, the maven of ADR, which is Barbara Harris. She comes in for ADR. Um, I can't think of names right now, but all of the major Fred Tattashore. People that have done, you know, when I teach a narration class, I get Kay Best, I get Bo Weaver, I get great, the best people that are always better than I am. And I just sit there and go, yeah, what he said, what she said, yeah. Do you ever come across a student that you're like, oh, man, that person's got a lot of talent, they're going somewhere? Yeah, well, short answer is yes, I'm trying to think of names. But yes, I do. And uh, they, I think, well, they don't need me at all. You know, right. They're just terrific. <laughs> um, so I do two things. I teach skills and I hone skills that are already there. Okay. And sometimes they don't need anything. Right. They just need encouragement. Yes. That helps. And um, I had a student come to me once and did a funny voice, and I paid him five, 50 bucks for the character. Really? It was, it was <laughs> no good. I got to give you 50 bucks for that character. Sure, why not? You should have asked for a hundred. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, do you ever have people that come to you and would like to become a voice actor and you got to be like, no, you're terrible. I know I personally have people come to me all the time asking me for advice about voice acting. They think they're going to be able to sit in their house and talk into a microphone and a funny voice all day and make a bunch of money. Like, how do you respond to someone who just kind of sucks? <laughs> <laughs> I really haven't had a whole lot of that. I, I have people with modest skills. Yeah. And they'll go somewhere else. Somebody that has a really good voice, maybe they'll do narration. Right. Where it's a less of a cause for acting. Um, for most genres, you have to act well. In fact, yeah. as many characters I did, I always say I cheated getting roles. I acted. So if you take, uh, for example, give me, I'll give you an example. Well, Crank, you've got this weird voice, this backwards in this way. Well, if you scrape all that off, yeah, you've got acting. Because I, I, I act underneath it. Right. And uh, in fact, um, that reminds me of something that's, that's not, well, that's similar, is they said, well, the description of Krang when I auditioned was a burbling blob of a brain, villainous, mean, but funny. Now, I thought, okay, great. Well, I'll, do, I'll throw that against the wall, but funny? Oh, well, listen to this. Fine, this is what I got for you. I'm getting myself for the hit. Fine, good, whatever you say. If you scrape that off. Fine, this is what I get for surrounding myself with idiots. Fine, you got a Jewish mother. Yeah, yes, you sure do. And, don't you? <laughs> and a Jewish mother is always funny. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, believe me, I'm old. I've been awake since I've been alive since the dawn of time. You know. <laughs> so I use that underneath Crank. Hmm. Nobody knew, not even the producers. Right, right. I'm sure they don't know how you come up with this with that. No, in fact, the director would tell me, well, I learned how to talk backwards in fourth grade. That is why talking backwards. Right. <laughs> and I thought I got that because when I got mad at my boys, I would get kind of get heartburn. I go, Uchi, don't leave, leave him alone. And I go, oh, man, it's kind of that sound. Right. When you say right. talking backwards, you mean breathing in while you're doing it? Going in yes, instead of going out? Okay. In while you're talking. Okay. Right. right. And so I thought, well, I can't do it between lines. It won't let me with time. But I can do it on uh, the line. And my director for nine years would go, Pat, Pat, on that word, don't, don't go low. She called it going low. She had no <laughs> idea what I did. And fine. Do you get recognized? Do people recognize your voice or do they? do people know what you look like? No. Because I didn't until I looked you up uh, many years they ago. They don't know what I look like, and they really don't know what I sound like unless I tell them. Because right. I don't use funny voices to buy, you know. Oh, yeah, and can I have a... <laughs> you know, I don't do that. So 
my wife teases me because I was looking at a YouTube of me because I'd sent it to somebody and she goes, oh, watching yourself on an interview, huh? <laughs> but uh, I don't do much of that because you, if you think about it, the worst people in the world are local newscasters. They're recognized by everybody and everybody talks to them and they make no money. Right. Yeah. Now, I totally get Brad Pitt and Harrison Ford. And these guys that live alone, they can't go anywhere without being recognized. I can shop. No problem. I can be mean. Nobody knows. I can be mean. <laughs> You're like the nicest person. I can't see you being mean. Well, well, by the way, when I was in Australia and I'd get ripped off by somebody or a, a cab driver was not good. Well, I'd insult them, but I used a British dialect. Well, aren't you the wonderful one? <laughs> you know, I'll never take another taxi from you again. And of course, they thought I was a palm. They called that British. You palm my bastard, you. Yeah, same to you, your family and your mother. Oh, I know her. <laughs> they never blended on being American. Insulting people in a different accent is a wonderful technique that I might have to employ. <laughs> yeah, also when, when somebody gang up on me or I could hear them talking about getting me, I'd, I'd go to them and speak in a fake uh, language. i go, go, you can that? And that, that would freak them out. They're going, yeah, go, go on. Just take a while. I see you do some Comic Cons. You'll you'll go to comic conventions and, and uh, sign autographs and whatnot for the people. Yeah, yeah, one that are close because I only have taken one flight since COVID. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, and so, like, uh, I went to Pasadena. I went to uh, local or short Sorry. plane trips. Because of that, because my wife uh, has got a serious health condition, and if I get her sick, she'll die. Yeah, yeah, I understand. So I'm, I'm very careful. Well, and you meet a whole lot of people at those things, too. And I'm sure they go yes. when they meet you because they're such big fans of, of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I mean, it really struck a nerve with people. What's the craziest thing that someone has done or said to you when they've met you at a Comic-Con? Well, I'm nothing crazy, although they're all on the uh, spectrum. They totally are. I mean, I said to my first assistant, I said, look, if somebody's on the spectrum, Alzheimer's, uh, you know, anything, whatever it is, Asperger's, I'll take care of it. They're all that way. On page 120, when you do two dollars of blue, what are you doing? What do you mean by that? And they're a little, their folks think they're a little insulting, but they're just straightforward. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and um, I think, the most dynamic thing was to be hugged. You know, that's yeah. all. I've never had anything bad happen. That's um, right. not, but uh, I once had a blind kid and my my mom grew up around the deaf and partially in her life, the deaf and blind. And I, I got my uh, exaggeration humor from my mom, but the exaggeration also was from being around the deaf. If, you, if you've ever been around people and seen a conversation between deaf people using their hands, they're very yeah. exaggerated. Yes. It was all about communication. Yeah. And um, I remember that a, a, a blind kid came up in a, in a, what do you call that? A preca, a stroller, a stroller. And he was with his folks. And I told my assistant, gave her money, I said, get the softest toy that you can find. Because we were at a convention, they had a little show. And yeah. bring it back to me. So she brought it back while I talked to the parents and stuff. And I gave it. It was a little lobster, about eight inches long and soft. And the child put the lobster in its mouth. That's what a blind person does because we're so sensitive around the mouth yeah. and the tongue. It made me weep. Oh. Because uh that's a that's what's happened. The most dynamic things are yeah. people that are challenged. In huh. fact, I gotta tell you a real fast story. I did tailspin and I played Wildcat. Okay. Which was a um the, the, the cohort to blue. This is kinda pretty for a rock. Anything you say and he was an ignorant but lovable mountain lion. Baloo is a ranger banana. I forget. Oh, look, there's a new island on the map. No, 
it's guacamole. <laughs> <laughs> so, 20 years after the show is on, I get a call from a psychologist in New York saying, would you take a call from one of my patients? I said, sure. It was a, uh, a person with, um, I can't remember the terms now. Uh, there's Asperger's and there's uh, what? Autism. Autism. At the time, they called her autistic. And she was very seriously autistic. Yeah. And she loved Wildcat. And to this day, I communicate with her. And she calls me Uncle Pat, and I call her Molly Cat. Well, here's why. She'd go to a public school where they had uh, resources on a bus and be humiliated all day and come back. And after school, she'd watch Tailspin and see me. Who she saw was, she thought was challenged. Yeah, and okay. everyone loved that character. Oh. And that, that put meaning in my life. Yeah. What I did. And by the way, Wildcat, when you're here, you know, a dead person talk with no tone, and Wildcat, it's very similar <laughs> and naive. That was my uh, connection. If Disney knew that, they would have never hired me. <laughs> Well, Pat, my 40 minutes is almost up. I only have a minute remaining on this Zoom call. I okay. thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. I really appreciate it. It's my and pleasure. I still am thrilled that I even got to take a class with you 10 years ago. And well, uh, you know, such I learned wonderful about. questions, too. Boy, they oh. were surprising and wonderful. You can sign up for Pat's voice acting classes on his website. I've posted links wherever you get this podcast. The next time you're watching an animated movie or show, you might be hearing Pat Fraley and you don't even know it. Thanks for joining me this week on Delightfully Different. Next week, I talk to a pet communicator. She talks to the animals like Dr. Doolittle. If you or someone you know lives life differently, email me, Lexi on the radio at gmail.com. That's L E X I on the radio at gmail.com. Or go to Delightfully Different Podcast.